Unmute. Uh, good evening, friends. And amongst us, we have Mr. Murti D. Nayak, Senior Advocate from Karnataka High Court. And he has done various sessions. Though, the, like we can say that he has done topics on different topics, though primarily on the criminal side, the sameness is that there is a underlying current of the deeper dive into the criminal law. And there's always a debate on the legal fraternity and otherwise as to whether we can have the FIR yeah. registered for the same offense time and again, or what is the way forward in these aspects. Registration of an another FIR as to whether if there are any other inputs, it can be done or what we did the legal journey in these aspects. Since it's a late evening, we'll not take much time and Mr. Nayak also has a working day tomorrow, and I will request him to share his knowledge. Over to you, Mr. Knight. Yeah. <coughs> Thank you, Vikas Ji. <coughs> Every time you ask me to speak on a topic, it's a learning experience for me. And in fact, Live Law, uh, um, I'm sorry, Beyond Law CLC is doing a fabulous job. I think this is the third year continuously it is conducting lectures and on a regular basis. <clears throat> it's very informative and it helps all of us. Now, straight away coming to today's topic, before we embark on registration of another FIR and sameness of offense, it would be prudent to understand the term offense. See various provisions which deal with offense <clears throat> under the CRPC is section 2A that is bailable offense and non-bailable offense. I will not go deep into the definition aspect. I will only touch upon broadly then you have section 2C, that is cognizable offense. Then 2L, non-cognizable offense. Then you have 2N of CRPC, which <coughs> defines offense as a whole. Then under section 40 of the IPC deals with the definition of offense. So this is one part. This is the first part which broadly deals with offense. Now the <coughs> second part, second and the most important part is mode of reporting of an offense, which is also known as setting the criminal law into motion. So the <coughs> first phase or the first step is information to the police, or you can also put it differently. One of the mode is information to the police under section 154, which is commonly known as the FIR. Then the second mode is complaint to a magistrate. And as all of you are aware, <coughs> a complaint is defined under 2D of CRPC, which deals with oral and written information. And upon a complaint, if it is a complaint which is written or complaint of facts, then cognizance is taken under 190 subsection 1A of CRPC. Also, another mode of taking cognizance of an offense is subsection 1 C of section 190 that is upon information received from any person other than a police officer 
or upon his own knowledge that such offense is committed. Now in this second mode that is complaint to a magistrate, when a complaint is <coughs> given to a magistrate, then the magistrate or, or in, in, in certain circumstances, if it is before a special judge or a special magistrate, then he has the option of postponing the process of taking cognizance. Instead, he can direct investigation to the police under 156.3. He can direct the police to take cognizance of the offense, investigate the same and file a report. So that is known as reference under 156.3 of CRPC. Under such circumstances, <coughs> the investigating officer has to register an FIR to set the criminal law into motion. Thereafter, conduct a investigation and file his report under 173.2. Likewise, in the this is similar to the first category when you approach the police directly in respect of a cognizable offense, then he is required to register an FIR under 154 CRPC before he embarks upon <coughs> or proceeds to investigate the offense. Hence, it is sine qua non that an FIR is registered in respect of a cognizable offence before the commencement of the investigation. Now, then you have investigation of non-cognizable offences <coughs> that is postulated in 155 of CRPC. If it is a non-cognizable offence, then the permission of the magistrate is to be obtained, etc. And once an in, uh, and in some cases, when an investigation is done in respect of a cognizable offence, but later on you get to know that it is a non-cognizable offence, the report filed by the investigating officer partakes the character of a complaint, as envisaged under section. 2D of CRPC. This you find it in explanation to 2D of CRPC. So <clears throat> broadly, these are the facets or these are the methods in respect of an offense, methods of investigation in respect of an offense. Everywhere, what, what is to be noted is everywhere the word employed in the code, be it the Code of Criminal Procedure or IPC uh, or any other statute or any other special enactment is a offense or an offense. So uh, an information or a complaint, call it by any name or a report is in respect of a particular offence. <coughs> Hence, now with this backdrop, we will discuss or we will embark on a greater examination of today's topic. So, how, how can an offence be investigated? Can there be multiple FIRs or can there be multiple complaints in respect of a particular offense? <coughs> All this has been time and again subject matter of scrutiny and examination at great detail by the various courts in the country starting with the Supreme Court, which have been, uh, uh, and the judgments of the Supreme Court have been consistently followed by the other high courts in the country. The 
prominent and the notable judgment on this point is that of T. T. Antony versus State of Kerala, that is 2001, Volume 6, SEC 181. <coughs> During the course of today's talk, I would be dealing with very few important judgments of the Supreme Court, which has dealt with various aspects of registration of a crime, registration of an FIR, complaint, etc. More particularly with special emphasis on registration of FI. So we will deal with the important judgments on this point. <coughs> Starting with T.T. Antony, that is as I have already given you the citation and most of you all must be aware, 2001, 6 SCC, page 181. The Supreme Court was dealing with a situation where the case emanated from a mob violence. <coughs> Hence, multiple FIRs <coughs> were registered in respect of an offense that took place on a particular day. Ultimately, these multiple FIRs were challenged before the High Court by filing a petition under 482. And the primary ground of challenge was that multiple FIRs or second FIR cannot be, or you can also put it this way, a subsequent FIR for the same offense cannot be registered. And as such, the subsequent FIRs should be treated as part and parcel of the first FIR. Hence, the Supreme Court, the two judges bench of the Supreme Court <coughs> held that there can be no second FIR and no fresh investigation on receipt of every subsequent information in respect of the same cognizable offense or same occurrence giving rise to one or more cognizable offenses. Only information about commission of a cognizable offense, which is first entered in station house diary by officer in charge of the police station, can be registered as FIR under section 154. All subsequent information will be covered by section 162. Officer in charge of the police station has to investigate not merely the cognizable offense reported in the FIR, but also other connected offenses found to have been committed <clears throat> in the course of the same transaction or same occurrence and file one or more reports as provided in section 173. Even if after conclusion of the investigation pursuant to filing of FIR, and submission of report under section 173.2, the officer in charge of the police station comes across any further pertaining to the same incident, he can make further investigation normally with the leave of court and forward the further evidence if any collected with further report or reports under section 173.8. Hence, all this <coughs> aspect of a multiple FIR, second FIR, etc., was considered uh, uh, in greater detail and very exhaustively and copiously the Supreme Court has laid down the law. And it has also held that any intrusion into <coughs> the right of an accused, unnecessary intrusion would amount to intrusion of his fundamental rights, thereby warranting interference either at Article 226 or 227, uh, 226 of the Constitution or under Section 482 of CRPC. Hence, all the 
subsequent FIRs that were registered were quashed by the Supreme Court. <coughs> Thereafter, this was, uh, in fact, in this judgment of T.T. Anthony, all the, uh, the previous judgments on the point, including State of Haryana versus Bajanlal, State of West Bengal versus Swapan Kumar Guha, etc., everything was considered. And thereafter, the law was laid down. Then after nearly four years, or to be precise, around three and a half years, the Supreme Court, <coughs> three judges bench of the Supreme Court, in the case of Upkar Singh versus Ved Prakash, dealt with the uh, with somewhat similar aspect that is pertaining to second complaint in regard to same incident filed as a counter complaint. And hence, it considered the law laid down in Antony's case and held that two FIRs, what is the meaning of two FIRs? And it went on to hold that second complaint in regard to same incident filed as a counter complaint held not prohibited under CRPC. So it distinguished T.T. Antony's case and held that if it is with regard to a counter allegation, that is, for example, <coughs> if the main allegation or the first FIR is in respect of an incident where A alleges that B tried to stab him along with C. And if a counter FIR or a counter information is filed with the same police station or any other police station by C or B stating that it was A who was the aggressor or A has indulged in certain illegal activities which amounts to an offence. Then it amounts to a counter allegation and a counter complaint and there is no prohibition as such to register a counter complaint. As all of you are aware, <coughs> it is in common parlance known as case and counter case. So, the T.T. Antony was clarified and right? it was held that the, uh, the judgment in T.T. Antony did not consider the legal right of an agreed person to file counterclaim. On the contrary, from the observations found in the said judgment, it clearly indicates that filing a counter complaint is permissible. If the law laid down in T.T. Antony case is to be accepted as holding that a second complaint in regard to the same incident filed as a counter complaint is prohibited under the criminal procedure code, then such conclusion will lead to serious consequences. This will be clear from the hypothetical example that if in regard to a crime committed by the real accused, he takes the first opportunity to lodge a false complaint and, and the same is registered by the jurisdictional police, then the aggrieved victim of such crime will be precluded from lodging a complaint, giving his version of the incident in question. Consequently, he will be deprived of his legitimate right to bring the real accused book. This cannot be the purport of the judgment, or uh, this cannot be the purport of the court. So this is what has been held in Upkar Singh, which is a three judges speech. <coughs> then there was a hiatus for almost six years. Then the Supreme Court in the case of Babu Bai versus State of Gujarat, and this is again a two judges bench 
judgment, which is reported as 2010-12 SEC 254, dealt with test of sameness, which is something akin to today's topic. That is test of sameness, two FIRs in respect of same transaction subsequent to registration of an FIR. What happens? So it was held that an FIR and a section 154 CRPC is a very important document. It is the first information of a cognizable offense recorded by the officer in charge of the police station. It sets the machinery of criminal law in motion and marks the commencement of investigation, which ends with the formation of an opinion under section 169 or 170, as the case may be, and forwarding of the police report under section 173 CRPC. Thus, it is quite possible that more than one piece of information be given to the police officer in charge of the police station in respect of the same incident involving one or more than one cognizable offenses. In such a case, he need not enter each piece of information in the diary. All other information given orally or in writing after the commencement of the investigation into the facts mentioned in the first information report will be statements falling under section 162. It has been further held that in case of a subsequent FIR, the court has to examine the facts and circumstances giving rise to both the FIRs and the test of sameness, <coughs> this is very important, test of sameness is to be applied to find out whether both the FIRs relate to the, relate to the same incident in respect of the same occurrence or are in regard to the incidents which are two or more parts of the same transaction. If the answer is in the affirmative, the second FIR is liable to be quashed. However, in case the contrary is proved where the version in the second FIR is different and they are in respect of two different incidents, public crime, the second FIR is permissible. In case in respect of the same incident, the accused in the first FIR comes forward with a different version or a counterclaim, investigation on both the FIRs has to be conducted. So this is how the Supreme Court, <coughs> after dealing with T.T. Antony, Upkar Singh, and the earlier judgment, that is Ramlal Narang, Ramesh Chandranandlal Parikh, Nirmal Singh Khelon, has laid down this law. And more particularly here, the Supreme Court was also dealing with a fresh investigation under 173.8. And it was held that ordinarily the court would order further investigation and not reinvestigation or fresh investigation. But <coughs> further investigation, uh, I'm sorry, uh, reinvestigation or fresh investigation can, can be ordered by the constitutional courts under exceptional circumstances or in exceptional and extraordinary cases where there is gross abuse of power and failure of justice. So if gross abuse of power is writ large from the facts of the case, then a fresh investigation or a reinvestigation can be ordered. And uh, of course, in this judgment, the concept of fair investigation and other things, everything ha has been dealt with. So uh, kindly go through this judgment because it not only touches upon the aspect of sameness of crime or sameness of offense, but it also deals with various aspects of 
an investigative process. <coughs> then you have the case of Amit by Anil Chandra Shah, that is 2013, 6 SCC 348. This is a notable judgment, again a two judges spent. Here the facts were there was a uh, there was an accusation of murder against the accused that is a fake encounter and subsequently one of the witness in the said murder case was also murdered hence two FIRs were registered the supreme court <coughs> considering the facts of the case and applying the law including C. Muniapan, that is 2010, 9 SEC 567, has again dealt with the aspect of when or has dealt with the question of when can a second FIR be registered or is a second FIR permissible and if so, under what circumstances? Hence, it has laid down very copiously the law and it held that it was part, if it is part of the same transaction. And here in this case, the Supreme Court has so very copiously dealt with <coughs> the concept of same transaction, which finds reference in. Uh, uh, the uh, relevant sections of uh, uh, CRPC pertaining to charge that we will deal with a little later. So it was held that there can't be a second FIR and as it forms part of the same transaction, there can be no fresh investigation or rather it was held that there can be no second FIR and consequently there can be no fresh investigation on receipt of every subsequent information in respect of the same cognizable offence or same occurrence or incident giving rise to one or more cognizable offences. This is very important. The risk of repetition I would read has been held that there can be no fresh investigation on receipt of every subsequent information in respect of same cognizable offence or the same occurrence or incident giving rise to one or more cognizable offences. <coughs> so uh, all the judgments uh, uh, commencing with Muniap or rather commencing with T.T. Antony, Shira Shivraj, Muniapan, all the judgments were uh, considered and uh, but that was the law laid down by the Supreme Court in Amit by Anil Chandra Shah's case. Then you have Audesh Kumar, that is 2016, 3 SEC, page 8. <coughs> Again, a two judges bench judgment of the Supreme Court. Here, the Supreme Court was again dealing with the concept of FI, second FIR and its uh, permissibility. So, the principles have been summarized, wherein it has been held that there can be no second FIR in the event of any further information being received by investigating agency in respect of the same offence or same occurrence or same transaction, kindly note, in respect of the same offence or same occurrence or same transaction giving rise to one or more offences for which charge sheet has already been filed by the investigating agency. 
रिकोर्स अवेलेबल विद इन्वेस्टिगेटिंग एजेंसी इन द सेट सिचुएशन इज टू कंडक्ट फर्दर इन्वेस्टिगेशन नॉर्मली विथ लीव ऑफ कोर्ट एज प्रोवाइडेड अंडर सेक्शन वन सेवेंटी थ्री एट सी आर पी सी हावेवर इट वॉज हेल्ड दैट दैड प्रिंसिपल वॉज नॉट एप्लीकेबल टू द fact situation in that case as the substance of allegation and transactions impugned in the two fias were different so some and substance of what was held there was in navdesh kumar's case was that if the allegation made in the second fir is different then the test laid down in antony and ukkar singh and other cases cannot be made applicable at a second fir is permissible in fact you may kindly make a note the relevant portion uh, the discussion uh, uh, is from para 21 where they have examined amit bai and anil chandra shah which in turn has relied on tt antony that is para 37 of amit bai's case then you go further <coughs> para 22 para 23 so in para 24 the supreme court in navdesh kumar's case has examined the relevant uh, portions of the law laid down in amit bai's case and in para 25 it has held that it is well settled principle of law that there can be no second fir in the event of any further information being received this portion i have already read and in para 26 it held that <coughs> however this principle of law is not applicable to the fact situation in the instant case as the substance of the allegations in the said two fir's is different the first fir deals with the offense punishable and section so and so of the act whereas the second fir deals with the offenses punishable in section 419 and 420 of ipc which i allege to have committed during the course of investigation of the case in the first fir this court is of the view that the alleged offense and the second fir in substance are distinct from the offenses under the first fir and they cannot in any case said to be in the form of the part of the same transaction they cannot in any case said to be in the form of the part of same transaction with the alleged offenses under the first fir therefore no question of further investigation could be made by the investigating agency on the alleged offenses arisen as the term further investigation occurred under subsection 8 to section 173 connotes the investigation of the case in continuation of the earlier investigation with respect to which the charge sheet has already been filed the reliance is placed on the judgment of this court in rama choudhury versus state of bihar the relevant para 17 reads thus para 27 they have held that therefore for the above said reasons the submissions made on behalf of both the appellants are not tenable in law and the same cannot be accepted by this court <coughs> further the case of amit bai and anil chandra shah upon which strong reliance is placed by the learned counsel for both the appellants is also totally inapplicable to the fact situation and it does not support the case of both appellants hence it held that in uh, in the said case it was held that uh, the offenses alleged in both the fir's were distinct and hence two fir's could be maintained now going further in the <coughs> case of 
Lalu Prasad Yadav, that is which all of you are aware pertains to the famous uh, fodder scam in Bihar, which is reported as 2017 8 SEC page 1. Here the Supreme Court made a fine distinction between same offence and same kind of offence. It was held that there is distinction between same offence and same kind of offence. So there it was held that the offences alleged were multiple and they were committed during <coughs> different periods and hence it cannot be said that said and argued that they are all part of the same transaction and hence it is the same offense and consequently one FIR should be registered and there should be one trial. And here this is where the Supreme Court has dealt with uh, uh, section 300 of CRPC, uh, uh, section 300 of CRPC and 219, 220, 221, which deals with uh, uh, multi multiplicity of charges, etc., charges of the same kind to be tried together, all these things which fall uh, under the heading charge. So, all these things were examined and the prayer for joint trial was turned down on the ground that it may be the same kind of offence, but it is not same offence or a single offence forming part of the same transaction. So, uh, the I would skip due to paucity of time, I would not refer to the relevant paragraph. However, it was, uh, it's a very lengthy judgment and it, it has been, in fact, with reference to 120B, it has been held that general conspiracy and number of separate conspiracies having similar general purpose, the distinction between the two is where different groups of persons operate towards their separate ends without any privity with each other. Each combination constitutes separate conspiracy. So this is what was held in uh, Lalu Prasad Yadav's case. And uh, it was also held in uh, paras 30 to 37 of the report that separate trial is the rule and joint trial is an exception. Joint trial would be an irregular exercise of discretion if a court allows innumerable offenses spread over a long period of time and committed by a large number of persons to be tried under the protected wings of an all-embracing conspiracy and if each or some of the offenses can be tried, can be separately tried, it would be appropriate and lawful. Joint trial prolongs the trial and causes waste of judicial time and complicates the matter which might otherwise be simple and it would confuse the accused and cause prejudice to them. Court should not be overzealous to provide a cover of conspiracy for a number of offenses unless it is satisfied that the persons who committed separate offenses were parties to the conspiracy and committed the separate acts pursuant to conspiracy. When several offenses are alleged to have been committed by several accused persons, normal rule is of separate trials. Further, when parties are different, issue of estoppel does not arise. And <coughs> it dealt with specifically dealt with section 218 CRPC and held 
that section 218 CRPC deals with separate charges for distinct offenses. Section 219 provides that three offenses of the same kind can be clubbed in one trial within uh, one trial committed within one year. Section 220 speaks of trial for more than one offense if it is in the same transaction. In the instant case, it cannot be said that defalcation is same transaction as the transactions are in different treasuries for different years, different amounts, different allotment letters, supply orders, and suppliers committed by different set of accused persons in different cases with respect to defalcation. Thus, Section 221 is not attracted. There may be a conspiracy in general one and a separate one. There may be larger conspiracy and smaller conspiracy which may develop in successive stages involving different accused persons. In the instant case, defalcations have been made in various years by combination of different accused persons. Thus, there can be separate trial. <coughs> so, this is very important with regard to uh, uh, joint trial, etc. And then, and here, uh, uh, most importantly, is the same offense and the same kind of offense, which has been emphasized. Then, in the case of State versus Kalyan Singh, <coughs> again, the provision of Section 218, 223 CRPC was dealt with and discussed. This pertained to the Babri Masjid demolition. This is reported as 2017, 7 SEC 444. Here it was held that a joint trial is permissible. And accordingly, a joint trial was ordered and the discharge of the main accused was set aside, etc. So I will not delve deep into <coughs> the nitty gritties of the said judgment. Uh, you may refer to the same as it is very lengthy. It is reported as 2017, 7 SEC 444. Here, the uh, concept of joint trial was dealt with, and it was held that all offenses committed in course of same transaction and to accomplish a criminal conspiracy, that is demolition of Babri Masjid, and hence a direction was issued to conduct a joint trial. So ultimately, the test is whether it was conduct, uh, it uh, whether, whether an offence was committed in the course of same transaction. Here it was held that the ultimate goal in furtherance of the conspiracy was to demolish the Babri Masjid and hence the criminal conspiracy, the ultimate goal being one, uh, a joint trial was permissible. Unlike in Lalu Prasad Yadav's case, it was held that the defalcation and misappropriation was committed at different periods of time, at different, uh, at different treasuries, by different people, uh, different set of people, conspiracy was different, different dates, so everything was different. Hence, separate trial was ordered. <coughs> now, Another notable and very important judgment on this point is in the case of P. Shri Kumar versus State of Kerala, 2018, 4 SEC 579. Here, again, the two judges bench of the Supreme Court dealt with second FIR and counter complaint, etc. And it ultimately 
held that. Uh, but here it is very interesting. The Supreme Court held second FIR by appellant against R3 though related to same incident for which first FIR was filed by R2 against appellant, R3 and three bank officials. Yet second FIR being in the nature of a counter complaint against R3 was legally maintainable and we could and could be entertained for being tried on its merits. <clears throat> it is for the reason that firstly, second FIR was not filed by the same person who had filed first FIR. Had it been so, then situation would have been somewhat different. Such was not the case here. Second, it was filed by appellant as a counter complaint against respondent three. Third, first FIR was against five persons based on one set of allegations, whereas second FIR was based on allegations different from allegations made in first FIR. And lastly, I quote, while quashing second FIR charge, did not examine issue arising in the case in the light of the law laid down by Supreme Court in Ukkar Singh and Surendra Kaushik. Hence, it was held that a second FIR is permissible <coughs> if the information is in respect of a counter complaint. So, this is on the lines of Ukkar Singh's case that is 2004. And even T.T. Antony was also uh, uh, cited here. All these judgments were considered and this was the law laid down by the Supreme Court in Sri Kumar's case. Now, very interesting case is that of Pattu Rajan versus state of Tamil Nadu. That is the case involving the owner of Sarvana Bhavan, wherein he was accused of and charged for the offense of murder and conspiracy, etc is reported as 2019 seven uh, for 2019 for SCC 771. That is Pattu Rajan versus state of Tamil Nadu. And here <coughs> there were two incidents. So it was argued that the original offense of kidnapping etc. formed part of the same transaction that is the second offense of murder of the husband of a woman sought to be secured as wife by the accused. So the Supreme Court held that the test of sameness cannot be applied here. Those are two different and distinct offenses and again dealt with the aspect of further investigation, fresh investigation, etc. <coughs> and held that incidents, transactions, offenses in question were uh, whether formed part of the same transaction oblique were in continuation of each other warranting only further investigation or were independent of each other warranting fresh investigation. So the entire principles <coughs> was explained in great detail and it was held that it warranted separate investigation and that the incidents and the transactions and the offenses were distinct and they were not in continuation of each other. Hence, two trials conducted were held to be correct and as such the conviction was confirmed. Here again, T.T. Antony, Ramlal Narang, Gaudesh Kumar, all these judgments were pressed into service, Nirmal Singh Kelon, etc. 
and after examining the principles on the point <coughs> the supreme court ruled the three judges bench of the supreme court ruled that the offense under 364 and 302 did not form part of the same transaction they were distinct and hence two fir's were permissible now friends this is the <coughs> law well settled law with regard to two fir's or call it by any name sameness of offense second fir further uh, information etc so under what circumstances can an fir be registered the second fir can be registered how a criminal law is set into motion how a counter complaint or a counter allegation has to be dealt with or a counter offense has to be dealt with all these aspects are well settled so there is no gray area as such with regard to <coughs> this part of criminal jurisprudence is concerned even in arnab ranjan goswami's case that is arnab ranjan goswami versus union of india reported as 2020 14 sec page 12 the very consolidation of several fir's registered in various states were sought by the petitioner before the supreme court and there the law has been laid down as to what amounts to uh, various offenses if various fir's are registered in various states alleging the same offense that is one offense or one incident if one incident gives rise to various fir's or various complaints then how such a situation has to be tackled or how it has to be dealt with has been copiously considered and dealt with by the supreme court in arnab ranjan goswami case so that was a case of consolidation likewise in <coughs> amish devgan a year later in amish devgan versus union of india 2021 one sec page 1 also this was a case where there were certain allegations against the petitioner for having made certain objectionable statements giving rise to multiple complaints multiple fir's for offenses primarily under section 153a of the ipc very net was alleged that certain section of the society was hurt the sentiments of certain section of the society was hurt by certain derogatory comments made by the petitioner during the course of his anchoring and this was again <coughs> dealt with very exhaustively by the supreme court in amish devgan's case even 153a of ipc and all the ancillary provisions all the ancillary questions of law were dealt with likewise very recently in the case of navika kumar versus union of india that is 2022 scc online sc 1289 is here again the supreme court was dealing with the consolidation of <coughs> offenses here again the petitioner was an anchor of a news channel that certain allegations were made against her that she made certain objectionable comments etc and so while dealing with and while allowing consolidation of fir's registered in various states the supreme court has laid down the law and has in fact 
followed the earlier law and has held that consolidation would be necessary. Now, a very important judgment with regard to large scale fraud committed by finance companies who accept deposits from gullible <coughs> customers by promising certain exorbitant interest rates or by promising certain things which they know from inception that it would not be possible. And mainly the offenses would center around cheating, breach of trust, all these things. Because right from inception, they would be aware that such a thing is not possible. So under such circumstances, the Supreme Court in the case of Narinder Jeet Singh Sani versus Union of India, reported as 2002, Volume 2, SEC 210, dealt with this aspect and has held that finance companies accepting deposits from a large number of persons, but not repaying the same then under such circumstances when the parties were different amount of deposit and the period for which the deposit was accepted were also different held each individual deposit agreement constituted an independent transaction and after holding thus has rejected the prayer for consolidation of all the FIRs that was registered against the promoters of <coughs> a finance company. And it was held that uh, the uh, parties or uh, who were in the form of depositors were different. The deposit amount was different, period was different, date of investment was different. So everything was different. So this was this is something similar to the case of Lalu Prasad Yadav, and uh, of course this emanates from a large scale fraud by a non banking finance company, which is very common in India. So on and off you have such frauds happening. So in this case it is held that consolidation is not possible. There has to be independent FIRs, independent investigation, and independent charge sheets, and consequently independent trials. So this is broadly the framework of the today's topic, that is registration of another FIR and sameness of effects. <coughs> I think we can take some Questions now, Vikasji. Vikasji, you are there? Yeah. I was just watching as to whether we have some questions on the YouTube. Yeah, correct. Yeah. Uh, no questions have somehow come on the chat as well as on the YouTube because you have explain the subtle difference between them that as to how it has to be a commonplace incident and so on and on. And I believe that everybody has accepted the way you have taken the things in the right way. And largely we have seen that from all these judgments, where even the high stakes were there, how the law has developed. And we hope that the participants who have watched us would have a lot of gain, gain say, at least I can say that we learned a lot. On, on behalf of the Beyond Law CLC team, we thank Mr. Murthy for sharing his time and that to at late us. Thank you, everyone. Stay safe.